Yeah, okay. Then, um, when a few years ago, uh, Anna Sapone and co-workers rediscovered the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or you may call it also non-celiac wheat sensitivity because we still not, don't know very clearly which is the trigger, if it's only gluten or ATIs, but this is not the, the subject of my talk today. But uh, at that time, that was just a few years ago, uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity was defined as a sy syndrome that is characterized by the intestinal and extraintestinal symptoms, which are related to the ingestion of gluten-containing food in subjects who are not affected by either celiac disease or wheat allergy, and uh, who go better when they start the gluten-free diet, very quickly, usually. As you can see here, was mostly and is mostly a, a negative diagnosis because you have to prove that the celiac disease serology is negative, the allergi allergicological tests are negative, the small intestinal biopsy is normal, so it's mostly an exclusion diagnosis. This has generated some confusion in the last year and this has been clearly shown by this paper from the David Sanders group, where they found that in the general population, um, there, there is a, a, a high proportion of persons who think to be gluten intolerant. You see 13%, but this, this is mostly a self-diagnosis. 3.8% uh, are on a gluten-free diet that has been prescribed by a doctor, and here probably there are many who are affected with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And uh, finally, 0.8% are true celiacs. So the numbers are very big, but we think that many of these persons are not really intolerant to gluten, and uh, they do the gluten-free diet. Maybe they go better, but their problems are a little bit different from the true non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So the reason we wanted to make this third meeting, this international meeting, was that uh, we wanted to, uh, re to have a, a positive diagnosis of non-celiac gluten sensitivity where it is important to catch the symptoms possibly some serological issues, and I'm sure that Professor Volta will talk about this, and mostly uh, to understand and to show the cause-effect relationship between the introduction of gluten and the clinical picture. This can easily be done with the gluten challenge, and then we wanted to standardize the methods of the gluten challenge. Um, just a, a few words on the clinical picture of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. We know from the literature that we have a, a, a wide range of symptoms that can be presenting symptoms of gluten sensitivity. For example, neurological, psychiatric disorders or um, the, the, uh, skin problems and many others. But uh, it is quite true that um, there are some symptoms that are quite typical of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. These are, at the same time, intestinal symptoms with bloating, with diarrhea, with uh, abdominal pain, associated very frequently with headache, with foggy mind, with some minor neurological problems. So this typical picture of non-celiac gluten sensitivity should be uh, reminded and highlighted. Um, how can we make the diagnosis of non-celiac gluten sensitivity? First step is to assess the clinical response to the gluten-free diet in a standardized manner. And then we have to measure the effect of reintroducing gluten after a period of treatment with the gluten-free diet. The problem is that many patients are seen by the specialist uh, when they are already on a gluten-free diet. Of course, in these cases, we go directly to step two, that is measuring the effect of reintroducing gluten, the gluten challenge. Uh, we 
suggested uh, has a group to use a, a modified version of the uh, GSRS score, uh, including, as you can see in the slide, some extra items um, that are not on in, in the in the gut, as I said, for example, headache, skin rashes, and and other symptoms that uh, can be associated with uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. This should be done uh, focusing on the major symptoms. We decided that it's better to ask to the patient for the major one to three symptoms and report on this questionnaire that is self-filled in by the patient uh, at baseline and then after starting treatment with a gluten-free diet on a weekly basis. Uh, the patient will um, report on the questionnaire a, a number which, which is included between 1 and 10 according to severity of the symptom. 1 is very mild and 10 is severe. Just to be more objective as it was possible. So uh, we uh, suggested that uh, uh, the patient can be defined as responsive to the gluten-free diet when there is a response that is a decrease of at least 30% of the baseline score in the major symptoms as a said before. In the patient who is responsive to the gluten-free diet or in the patient who come to us already on treatment, then we can move to step two, which is the double-blind placebo-controlled crossover challenge. This is certainly the best way to prove that the gluten is the cause of the problems of the patient. This must follow at least four weeks of gluten-free diet. Then we suggested to, to continue the treatment with a gluten-free diet, but give to the patient a one-week treatment in a double-blind manner uh, of treatment A or B. This is randomized, of course. Then we have one week of washout where the patient continues only the gluten-free diet, and then the other one-week treatment. How much gluten? We thought that eight grams per day could be, could be the proper amount because this is quite similar to the daily intake of gluten, which in Western country is between 10 to 15 grams of gluten per day. And uh, it is important that uh, ATIs are included in this uh, in this gluten preparation, at least 0.3 grams for the effort that we know this protein has on the innate immune response. Again, the patient is asked to identify one to three main symptoms to be reported daily, this time, on the questionnaire, the same questionnaire that we use for the um, step one uh, phase. And again, at least a 30% increase of the score with gluten compared to placebo is required to definitely confirm the diagnosis of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, we had some discussion on the vehicle. Uh, everyone in the group uh, suggested that uh, capsules are not the best way to administer gluten to the patient. Uh, we still need some work to, to prove what is better, but uh, most of us believe that the gluten bar could be a nice solution. Of course, we need to have another bar without gluten that has the same taste, the same consistency, the same characteristics of the gluten bar. And this is the flow diagram that... Uh, uh, summarize what I said uh, in the previous slides. As you can see, uh, you have the step one where the patient start the gluten-free diet and uh, every week fill in the questionnaire. If there is improvement, then 
the suspicion of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, of course, is increased. If there is no response, other diagnoses can be considered. For example, FODMAPs intolerance or other problems. Um, if there is improvement, we start step two with the three weeks challenge, one week with the treatment A and the washout, and then one week with the other treatment. In the end, if we have improvement, at least 30%, if we have worsening, I'm sorry, of symptoms with the gluten preparation, then the diagnosis of non-celiac gluten sensitivity can be confirmed. Well, uh, the reason we spent so much time to discuss what is the protocol of diagnosis of, of non-celiac gluten sensitivity is that we need to make a step uh, forward and uh, avoiding the self-diagnosis, but also the elimination diagnosis is not the best way. And what we need is really a positive diagnosis where we find clinical elements, possibly serological elements, and we will hear about this, and the F and the, the, the proof of the double blind placebo, the evidence of the double blind placebo control test. Uh, again, this uh, was the group, uh, and we had the opportunity to work in this lovely place in Salerno, Italy. We didn't only have fun, as it can seem here, but we also worked a lot, and this is the paper that is now available um, for all of you, if you are interested on this journal, Nutrients, uh, let me remind you that we have, together with uh, Alessio Fasano, we are the editor of a special issue on non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Basically, the deadline for uh, submitting publication uh, manuscripts is already over. It was uh, the end of May, but I guess that the editors will be pleased to consider a very interesting paper you, you might have on to submit on non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Well, I think I was in time, and then let's go on. <laughs>